Hey everyone, thanks for joining in this week. I hope you guys enjoyed um, starting our new story last week as we started to learn about this doctor who went all the way out to the African uh, Congo to help people, uh, not only to get better uh, physically, but to really help them spiritually. And today we're going to be reading chapter 2, but it's going to go a little bit back into the life of Dr. Becker, and we're going to learn a little bit more about him before he went to the Congo. We're going to learn how he got saved. We're going to learn a little bit more about his family, okay? So let's get started with chapter two. How do you make a doctor? Carl K. Becker was born on January 30th, 1894 in Mannheim, Pennsylvania. As a small boy, he attended Sunday school at a church in the morning, then walked two miles with his father, brother Frank and sister Helen, to attend afternoon services in a village called Sporting Hill. When Carl was 11 years old, his father died. His mother worked in a factory to earn money to buy food and clothing. Carl, already in ninth grade, was getting better grades than the older boys. He was also becoming interested in medicine. One day after class, the pastor of the church said to him, Carl, you have to make a personal decision for Christ. Even though your parents are Christians, you must come to God yourself. The Lord Jesus died in your place. He shed his blood so you could be forgiven of your sin. That day, Carl accepted Christ. His life changed. Now he didn't do everything his friends did. Instead, he began to pray and read more of the Bible every night. He wanted to obey God. Carl's Sunday school teacher was Mrs. Anna Crady. The boys in her class loved her, and because of Mrs. Crady's love for God's word, they learned to love his word too. Mrs. Crady was also concerned about missions. She told her class that deep in the middle of Africa, there were millions of people who had never heard the gospel. The Belgian Congo, she said, is full of cannibals, lions, and giant snakes. It's not safe at all. But Africa Inland Mission wants to send missionaries there. The Belgian Congo, these were mysterious, shivery words Carl remembered from history class. Something stirred inside his heart. Could I go there, he wondered. A little later, Mr. Lee Downing of Africa Inland Mission spent three weeks in Mannheim, and Carl talked to him about medical missions. Why do you need missionary doctors, Carl asked. I thought missionaries just preached and taught the Bible. Doctors prepare the way for preachers and teachers, Carl. The Africans live in fear of disease, which they think is a curse from evil spirits. The witch doctor uses that fear. He makes the people bring him many gifts without even helping them. A missionary can't just preach to somebody who has a toothache or who is bleeding or choking or hurting. He must also care for the needs of the body. Carl thought about that for many days. Was God calling him to be a missionary, doctor? He would love to be a doctor, but it would take six years to go through medical school. One night, he fell to his knees on a grass plot behind their small house and prayed, Lord, if you will help me become a doctor, I will be a missionary if you call me. Carl was only 15 when he graduated from high school. The following year, he went to Mercersburg Academy, then Ursinus College. But after a year there, he left and worked at various jobs to support his mother. When he was 22, Carl entered Hanneman Medical College in Philadelphia with only $125. Life became all study and hard work. By the end of his first year, Carl worked at two jobs. Nights, he served ice cream and made sodas at a soda fountain in the Reading Terminal train station. A few hours a day, he worked in a deli. After classes, Carl returned to the third floor apartment he shared with three other students. He lived in his only worn out suit and a pair of broken down shoes. In spite of his jobs, money was running out. Then World War I began during Carl's second year in medical school. America entered the war and Carl joined a reserve medical corps. The corps moved its members into the local armory. Carl found to his surprise that now he had free room and board a uniform to wear, plus $30 a month. God was taking care of him. Finally, in 1921, after five years in school, Carl was ready to graduate. One day a month before graduation, he prayed, Lord, all I have that is fit to wear are my army shoes and the old coat. My mother and sister will be embarrassed when they see me. Will you help me? Within a week, Carl received $100 in checks from friends. His simple faith in his Heavenly Father would help him later in the Congo. During college, Carl had sometimes visited his mother in Reading, Pennsylvania. On one visit, his brother Frank introduced him to a young school teacher, Marie Bodie. She was a Christian. One of the first things Carl told her was, Marie, my life belongs to God. I don't know where he'll send me, 
I promised him that if he helped me become a doctor, I would go anywhere he asked. Marie agreed absolutely that God and his will should always come first in their lives. During the following months, Carl and Marie grew to love each other. At Hanuman, the rule stated that new doctors must work for their hospital for a year. During that year, Carl met Charles Herbert of Africa Inland Mission, who had lived for many years in Africa. Now, Charles Herbert is the father of Paul Herbert, who we've learned about in our last chapter. Carl, we need missionary doctors. We've discovered a tribe of 200,000 people called Babira. The witch doctors with their native medicine have caused the death of more people than the slave traders. We can't send just preachers in there. We need a doctor. Carl finished the sentence for him. We don't have a doctor to send. Is God calling me to Africa? Carl wondered. But his mother was a widow, and Carl remembered a verse he had read in the Bible. If any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Carl knew that meant his first duty was to take care of his mom. In 1922, Dr. Carl Becker moved to Boyerton, Pennsylvania. He was 28 years old. The three doctors who had taken care of the townspeople had moved away. Dr. Becker found plenty of patients waiting for him. Three months later, he married Marie Bodie. In those days, doctors made house calls, visiting people at home who were too sick or injured to go to a hospital. One night, in the middle of a snowstorm, two farmers were woke Carl by hammering on the door. Dr. Becker grabbed his black bag and hurried outside. One farmer called above the howl of the wind, We have no electricity out our way because of the storm. Dr. Becker hurried to his next-door neighbor, Dr. Bornman. You'll have to assist me tonight, he said to the dentist, as they climbed into the doctor's car. At the farmhouse, by the light of a flashlight, Dr. Becker brought a baby safely into the world. Seven years passed in Boratown. Dr. Becker still hadn't kept his promise to God. Although he and Marie prayed about missions, God hadn't shown Dr. Becker yet how he wanted him to serve. Instead, God allowed Dr. Becker to put money into the bank for his mother. During this time, three important events occurred in his life. Dr. Becker was asked by a government official to move to Washington, D.C., where he could make more money as a doctor. A wealthy man in Boyerton offered to build him a big new hospital if he stayed there. Then Boyertown would grow and the doctor would earn more money. And a letter came from Mr. Charles Herbert of, um, of America Inland Missions, saying their missionary doctor had died of black water fever because there was no one to care for her. There was no mention of money. The need in Africa for doctors, especially in the Congo, was greater than ever, but Dr. Becker was earning 10000 a year, a lot of money at that time. One evening, as the doctor was in his office praying, the Holy Spirit, who lives within every Christian, spoke to his heart. It was that simple. Dr. Becker called Marie into the room. My dear, do you remember my promise to God that I made 10 years ago? Tonight, God and I made, or tonight, God definitely reminded me of it. I think he wants us to be missionaries. I'm going to write Mr. Hurlbert. Three letters came flying back from Mr. Hurlbert, one after another. He was thrilled to know Dr. Becker would go to the Congo. How soon can you be ready, he wrote. Mrs. Becker, six-year-old Mary, and three-year-old Carl were happy about the decision. Soon, the news spread all over Boyertown, but the people weren't happy. We don't want to lose our doctor, they exclaimed. Local businessmen announced a meeting at the American Legion building, a rally in honor of the doctor. He was embarrassed at seeing 400 people applaud and cheer him and beg him to stay in Boyertown. What he said to them was simple and direct. Many years ago, I made a promise to God that I would give my life for his use if he would help me become a doctor. I am going to the Belgian Congo. Dr. Becker was promised $60 a month while on the mission field. He was earning 14 times that much in Boyertown. However, the same God who had provided new clothes for his graduation from medical school would take care of him and his family. In August 1929, they left home taking their car and many 60-pound bundles of medical equipment and belongings. In October, after crossing the Atlantic Ocean by ship and crossing Europe by train, they traveled across the Mediterranean Sea through Egypt, then farther south until they reached the Congo. Finally, after a 25-mile hike up the side of a mountain, the family reached Kitsambaro and their first home, a mud hut. Paul Herbert welcomed the Beckers. You'll have to share our hut until we build one for you, he said, 
motioning to his two-room home. It will be crowded since we have five children, but you can have one room. We just added it for you. Turning to Mrs. Becker, he continued, We don't cook indoors. I'm afraid you'll have to learn to cook over those three stones behind the hut. And after you're settled, Dr. Becker, you'll need to get acquainted with your future patients. He pointed to some tribesmen standing among the trees in the distance. It was several days later when Dr. Becker stepped outside and found the witch doctor's curse. And that is the end of our chapter two for today. And um, we got to learn a little bit more about who Dr. Becker was and a little bit more about how he became a Christian. And we learned about how he made a promise to God. And he never forgot that promise. And the Lord never forgot that promise either. You know, sometimes we can make promises. We can say, Lord, I promise I will obey my parents more. Or, Lord, I promise I won't sin anymore. Or we make silly promises like that, sometimes not really thinking about if we can keep them or not. You know, God takes promises very serious. He knew and he would never forget that Dr. Becker promised that he would give his life to him and do whatever he wanted him to do. And when the Holy Spirit pricked his heart and told him it was time to go, Dr. Becker knew he had to obey that promise that he had made to the Lord a long time ago. So next week, we're going to learn a little bit more about Dr. Becker and how he began his new life there in the Congo. Thanks for joining in.